so much for coming out on this uh, hot, hot, hot day. I do appreciate your support of our program. I want to welcome you to the third annual educational seminar for the Center of Bloodless Medicine and Surgery at Johns Hopkins. And we really are happy to see everyone attending today. We have a great program lined up with terrific speakers. Now, along with an overview of our bloodless program by Dr. Stephen Frank, and Progress and Successes with Bloodless Strategies by Dr. Linda Razar. We're also privileged to have Dr. Stacy Scheib, who will discuss minimally invasive gynecological surgery, as well as a live demonstration of the cell saver system by Tim Boyle, a consultant with the Hemonetics Corporation. First up is Dr. Stephen Frank, and Dr. Stephen Frank is a professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His area of clinical expertise is anesthesia for vascular, thoracic, and transplant surgery. He's an expert in blood conservation methods. Dr. Frank serves as the medical director for the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Program. He is also director of the Interdisciplinary Blood Management Program and of Perioperative Blood Management Services at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And please welcome Dr. Stephen Frank. Thank you, Andy, for that kind introduction. And welcome, everybody. I'm so glad uh, that we can get together to have this seminar. And for the first time ever, we're going to try to do a live cell saver demonstration. So um, we do have three speakers. And then Tim Boyle will be the fourth speaker. And he'll do the uh, demonstration. So uh, this is our agenda today. I'll start out with an overview of our uh, center. And then Tim will come up and do the cell saver demonstration. Uh, Stacy Scheib uh, and Linda Reesar will follow, uh, like Andy said, with uh, gynecologic surgery and recent advances in our field. So our primary goal as a center at Johns Hopkins is to respect you and your family's wishes uh, when it comes to avoiding transfusion. Uh, and the patient comes first. So uh, we've, we've been doing this for four years now. So we, we know how to uh, conserve blood. And I'm going to show you the 10 different ways that we use to conserve blood so we can get patients through the hospital without needing a transfusion. And we also like to, to treat our patients as if they were family members. So we spend more time with the patients uh, than, than the typical patients, because there's a lot to talk about uh, when it comes to honoring your wishes. Uh, this is our website. And this is the front page uh, of the Center for Bloodless Medicine and Surgery at Johns Hopkins. And uh, note that uh, there's a cell saver on the front page of our website. Uh, and how does it work, it says. So we're going to see how it works. And uh, I'll tell you what a cell saver is in just a minute. Uh, these are the methods that we use of blood conservation to provide bloodless care. So I like to say that the best transfusion is no transfusion. Uh, the second best transfusion is to use your own blood for the transfusion because it belongs to you. Uh, and this is how we avoid transfusions. Uh, first of all, if you have anemia before surgery, we like to diagnose it and treat it. For example, $5 worth of iron pills uh, can avoid $500 worth of blood. So if we can simply treat your anemia before you come into the hospital, Sometimes we give intravenous iron, for example, or even erythropoietin, and Linda will talk about that. Uh, good surgery, uh, for example, laparoscopic and robotic surgery uh, are new ways that, that we use to uh, reduce bleeding during surgery. And at first I thought robotic surgery was just a marketing gimmick, to be honest. And then I looked at the, at the blood loss in robotic surgeries, like prostate surgeries, and it was a fraction of the blood loss that we see uh, with the traditional open surgeries. Um, blood salvage, or the cell saver, 
has been called the centerpiece of blood conservation. So this is what the cell saver looks like. Uh, Tim is going to give you the whole history and the background behind uh, how it came on the scene back in the 1970s. Uh, and this is really uh, the way we, we collect your blood you lose during surgery and give it back to you. So uh, it's really your own blood, it's fresh, it hasn't been sitting around. Uh, and it's, it's the best way to conserve blood during surgery. Uh, we minimize blood loss to lab test. We use special drugs like uh, TXA and Amacar that can reduce bleeding. Uh, we use point of care testing and education like we're doing today. So this is our uh, first big article uh, that came out as a review. It, it, this is a, a Linda Riesar, who's the first author, is going to be our, one of our speakers today. And uh, this is a review article explaining the 15 different things that we do special. Uh, so our goal is to educate people around the world, that's doctors and nurses and patients. So these articles are available on the web. And if you want to learn more, uh, you can read what we wrote. Uh, this is a study that we published uh, from our team in 2014, so two years ago, uh, showing how our patients do better than patients who accept transfusion because they get this special kind of care. For example, uh, if you look at heart attack, respiratory, renal, or thrombotic events, if you compare the bloodless patients to the control patients, so that's everybody else in the hospital, uh, so the bloodless patients had less infections and less deaths, so lower mortality uh, than the patients who take transfusion probably because there's risk with transfusion that comes from the blood bank. And we also showed a lower cost and charges in the bloodless patients, about a 12 to 14 percent decrease in cost and charges because blood coming from the blood bank is expensive. It's more expensive than using the cell saver. Uh, Linda and I wrote another article uh, in 2014 uh, on bloodless medicine, what to do when you can't transfuse. So our goal here is to educate doctors around the world on how to provide this type of care. Uh, so these articles are available for anybody with web access. Uh, and Linda presented this uh, at the largest blood meeting in the world, the American Society of Hematology, uh, which had uh, maybe 10,000 people something more than that, okay? So Linda had the honor of presenting uh, our work at that meeting. Uh, this is an editorial that I wrote uh, about the cell saver uh, and who benefits from red cell salvage. Uh, I talked about when we should use it and, and who we should use it on. Uh, and then our article got written up in the newspaper uh, both the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, and we proved that recycled blood or cell saver blood was a higher quality than the stuff that comes from the blood bank because it's fresh, okay? And the stuff in the blood bank has been sitting around for up to six weeks. So blood's like milk in the grocery store, okay? It doesn't get better when it sits around, uh, and you'd rather use it fresh, like from the cell saver. In fact, we showed uh, in the study that uh, 2, 3 DPG, which is it's a good thing to have, was much higher in cell saver blood than it was in, in the blood bank blood. Uh, and so that means the cell saver blood can deliver oxygen better. And I, I won't bore you with all the science here, but if you look at 2, 3 DPG on the left, in the, in the stored blood, in the light blue, uh, that's banked blood. It was 95% depleted, but in the cell saver blood, it was normal, okay, the same as fresh blood. And so this got written up in the, in the uh, news media as well, and uh, they talk about reusing a patient's own blood, which is exactly what the cell saver does. Uh, we do everything we can to minimize blood loss due to lab testing. Uh, 
so we found that just by sending labs on patients in the hospital, blood tests, uh, that you can lose about 1% of your blood every day just to lab test. And so we started using these small tubes. You see the ones on the left? Uh, those are neonatal tubes. So we can use those on adults too uh, to minimize the blood that you lose uh, just for lab tests. And our next article to come out uh, is called Bloodless Medicine and Surgery, Top 10 Things to Consider. So this comes out next month. Uh, this is a preview of a, the next article that Linda and I wrote. Uh, and these are the 10 methods that we use, uh, 10, top 10 things to consider when uh, providing bloodless care. Uh, I just want to tell you that we successfully did a 13-pound baby for open heart surgery uh, at Johns Hopkins. That's really tricky to do without blood because uh, the amount of blood in a 13 pound baby is slightly more than what's in a can of Coke, okay? Uh, that's how much blood the baby has. So you can imagine how, how small the amount of blood that they can afford to lose would be. Uh, and I just want to show a four minute video, if you will, uh, and then we'll move on to the cell saver demonstration. The, uh, the video that, that we made came out fabulously. So, give me one sec. It's on the front page of our website if you want to show it to other people. And here it is. My neck looked like a bullfrog pumping. Have you ever seen like a bullfrog with a, with a, in its throat pumps like that? That's what my neck looked like. All that blood was regurgitating up there. These flowers are coming out pretty, aren't they? My name's Tammy, live in Christiansburg, Virginia. All my family, for the most part, has been really healthy. And I didn't know I had blood pressure problems. Tammy presented to us with a large aortic aneurysm that you could see pulsating in the base of her neck, right above her breastbone. And that's a ballooning of the artery in the chest. Her blood pressure when she presented was 240 over 40. She had a leak in her aortic valve in her heart. So the one-way valve was allowing two-way blood flow. And yeah, I was like, this blood pressure is like, really? How, why are you still alive? People couldn't believe you're still alive with this blood pressure like that. We searched for a place to go for six months. We found out that Andy Pippa was the coordinator for the bloodless surgery program there at Johns Hopkins. Tammy called us because she couldn't find a doctor or a hospital that would uh, operate on her without resorting to a blood transfusion. I did not want to do this no blood transfusion period. That's one reason it bothered me because they said it was such a bloody surgery. But with my religion being a Jehovah's Witness, I wasn't going to take any blood. But I also didn't want to die on the operating table either. The fact that she took her stand for, for no blood transfusion and the courage that she showed was an inspiration to me. Our bloodless program is designed to care for patients who wish to get therapy for their illnesses or to undergo a surgery without receiving transfused blood products. And so our role as the bloodless program is to care for these patients, to get them ready for surgery when they need surgery, to keep their blood at a, you know, a healthy level. Every time we avoid a transfusion, we avoid potential complications like hepatitis, there's HIV, taco and trally, which are complications from blood transfusion that can be fatal. Okay, so this is a fresh blood sample. So by avoiding unnecessary transfusions, we're actually saving lives. And I haven't met a patient yet that wouldn't rather have their own blood back uh, as opposed to someone else's blood coming from the blood bank. Nobody plans to go to the hospital. It's, it's really a scary place to be. The fact that I can make a patient feel more at ease is key to their having a good outcome. We had to be um, very careful with Tammy because we wanted to be sure that her level of blood, the strength of her blood, was at a safe level for her to get through the surgery. We did several things special in the operating room. First, we did something called ANH, where we bank the patient's own blood right before the surgery begins. Then we used a medication called Amicar that reduces bleeding during surgery. And third, uh, we use a device called a cell saver. 
which collects the blood that patients lose during surgery, cleans it, processes it, and then we can give them back their own blood before the end of the procedure. In Tammy's case, without the cell saver, I'm not sure we could have brought her through the surgery successfully. As our bloodless program has grown over the years, we've gained a lot of experience and expertise in caring for these patients. By providing care to Jehovah's Witness patients, for example, we're perfecting methods of blood conservation that will benefit all patients. The compassionate nature of this team, everybody on it, makes the patients feel special. I'm very grateful for Johns Hopkins, for the blood of the surgery team. I made it, and I did it without no blood. We, uh, we were so pleased with the way the video came out. I had to show it. Sorry, we, we love this video. And. Uh, <laughs> With that, I'm going to introduce Tim Boyle, uh, who drove here all the way from Richmond, Virginia, and brought the cell saver with him. And so this is Tim, uh, and uh, Tim's going to talk about the history of the cell saver, and then we'll do a demonstration. And we've never done this before, so I'm hoping that it works. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. As, as uh, Dr. Frank shared, my name is Tim Boyle. I'm one of the blood management consultants with Hemonetics. I just want to give you a little history of blood conservation. Where did we come from? You know, why we do what we do? Um, back in the 1600s, a uh, French physician by the name of uh, Jean Denet uh, performed transfusions between animals and humans. As you can expect, uh, it didn't go well. Um, and then in 1818, we have an English surgeon by the name of James Blundell who actually uh, reported studies of doing human-to-human -human transfusions. Uh, again, the results were not favorable. Uh, one of the reasons is, as we know today, what, what is your blood type? If you give somebody the wrong type of blood, they're going to have negative reactions. So this is why um, James reported the, uh, the challenges that they had with the human-to-human -human transfusions uh, back in the early 1800s. And then we move forward to the end of the century uh, with the first re record and report from Dr. James Highmore, who advocated the utilization of doing salvage blood return during surgery. In other words, auto transfusion, getting their own blood back. <coughs> so then we come up to our century, and we come to the Vietnam War era. Um, and an American military surgeon by the name of uh, Dr. Uh, Glebenhoff utilized an open heart pump. Um, to collect the patient's blood, you know, the soldier, collect that soldier's blood, anticoagulate it, so we would not have coagulation occur, so we could process it. And then he filtered it, and then we reinfused blood during surgery. And then in the 70s, a company by the name of Bentley Laboratories brought that device to the marketplace. And then also con going in concert with uh, all of these steps, a Dr. Cohn and a Dr. Jack Latham looked at utilizing a centrifuge for um, separating blood components because of the need for albumin in the battlefield for our soldiers. Um, and it, as you can see uh, in the slide, they literally got the idea from a dairy process uh, separation. Uh, so we can thank our whole milk and our cream and everything for a lot of transfusion. Then along comes uh, Dr. Layton, where he improved upon Dr. Cohn's stainless steel bowl and uh, for his cone fractionator. He then in, developed it into a plastic bowl, which we still use today. Uh, we use the exact same bowl in, in the device that we have in front of you today that we used back in the early 70s. Um, I got into open heart surgery, uh, running the pump, um, you know, being a perfusionist, uh, back in those, actually in the early days. And the devices looked so different back then. Uh, today, the, the device that we have in here today to show you demo is the latest, and as they tease in marketing, the latest and the greatest. And uh, it makes it so much simpler for the clinician to operate and separate the blood out. So you're actually getting back uh, whole red blood cells. In 1975, Dr. Latham, in concert with other folks at Hemonetics, brought the very first 
self saver to market. And then in 78 uh, is when I got my hands on the, for the very first time on one. We, I literally used the very first one that was undeveloped. This is a Pitcorn representation of what the bowl looks like. Uh, and as you can see in the center here is a capillary tube. So the blood is coming from the, the surgical field. The blood comes into the cell saver. Um, and goes down through this capillary tube and hits this plate right here that Dr. Latham um, invented. Uh, and so we still hold the patents to this today. Um, and as, as the blood comes in, this bowl is spinning at 5,650 RPM. So as you drive home today, look down at your RPM and figure out how fast you're going down the highway. Uh, and then consider if you had Jack's bowl underneath your hood, you'd probably get there quicker. Um, <laughs> to the side of the road with blue lights behind the problem. <laughs> but in our creator's infinite wisdom, red blood cells are the heaviest part of, the, of our blood. So as this bowl is spinning, um, the red blood cells are pushed out against the outside, outside wall of the bowl, and then all of the other components of the blood, as you can see here represented in yellow, will then be pushed out into a waste bag. Um, and I'll get through the process a little bit deeper, but I wanted you to see exactly what the, is going on inside the bowl, because when we do the processing and we do the live demo, you actually can't see that because the bowl sits down inside the, the device. So why, what are the advantages of doing uh, auto transfusion or cell saving? You want to avoid you know, a transfusion at all costs. You know, uh, our blood supply is the best and the safest it ever has been and anywhere in the world. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Frank shared with you, you want to get your own blood back if, if at all possible. Um, the, and the value to that is that you're not going to have an allergic reaction to it because it literally is a transplant. Um, and then also you have your high quality of fresh red blood cells. Um, Dr. Frank shared with you 2,3-DPG, which I affectionately call the key that releases that bond between hemoglobin and oxygen so you get tissue oxygenation. Um, also, while blood is being stored, uh, you can, it, well, it's aging, just like we are all doing sitting in this room right now. So you will have a little bit of hemolysis that occurs even in the bag. Um, getting your own blood back, you also reduce the chances of um, having a transfusion error. Uh, and definitely when you get your own blood back, that's not going to happen. Uh, the other thing is also reduces the demand on the blood bank inventory. I'm sure we've all seen in the news and the internet, newspapers, uh, a request for people of a certain blood type uh, to come in and donate blood because of a shortage. Uh, platelets, which uh, come, out of, come out of the blood, separated out, uh, we've had a tremendous shortage of that in the Richmond area uh, as of late. The other reason, too, for uh, utilizing cell saving is for the psychological benefits. You know, I don't want, no offense, I don't want anybody's blood in this room, you don't want behind either. Um, and uh, so you want to get your own blood back. The indications for doing cell saving is the patient, you know, you don't want to have it done. Um, and with the Joe Witten's fate, uh, definitely not. Uh, one of the things, too, is that when um, with the uh, hospital liaisons with your videos, you actually see one of our other devices. It's called Orthopath that's represented in that video. Uh, it's a very small cell saver. I teasingly call it the cell saver on a stick on an IV pole. So this is our Tootsie Roll, and that one's the Tootsie Pop. Um, <laughs> then also, um, if you're going to have 15 to 20 percent of your blood loss in surgery, you definitely want to uh, have a consideration for do, doing cell saving. Also, if you're going to be transfusing more than one unit of, of blood, uh, you may want to opt out of that and, and then utilize the cell saver. Um, also, if you want to have surgery that's a surgery where normally you'll have uh, transfusions done, you definitely want to do that. Um, the other reasons, too, is because people who have had multiple transfusions, or many, they literally develop their own blood type, and it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to type and cross-match them. Um, I'll give you an example. Is I had a knee replacement done about six years ago, but when I was younger, uh, in fact, when Dr. Frank and I were in the Kansas City area, I also used to race motorcycles, and I had uh, quite a few transfusions from hitting things that were not moving, and I was. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, made it, it made it a little uh, tough for me. I was not evil Knievel, 
I figured that out pretty quick, so I got into healthcare. Uh, types of procedures, as you can see on the, on the display, cardiac surgery, definitely, uh, transplants, um, liver transplants, um, orthopedic trauma, most definitely, and one of the things that I hold near and dear to me is in pediatrics. One of the things that uh, is unique within the pediatric community is for scoliosis uh, repair. So you think about all the things that we do with blood and giving blood, to, you know, getting a transfusion from someone else uh, into your body. You definitely don't want to start that at an early age. So it's great to keep children uh, from having to have a, a transfusion. The next thing I wanted to share with you, and this is our, one of our older platforms. In fact, we just retired the manufacturing of the Cell Saver 5 Plus, uh, which had been in manufacturing for over 20 years. Um, it is the uh, cornerstone of the industry. And in fact, uh, as uh, Dr. Frank shared with you and I have so far, is that we invented the technology. We've, uh, we're the industry leader in the technology around the world. We manufacture around the world. Um, and what we do is we collect the blood from the surgical field, and then we do processing. There's three steps. We're going to fill the bowl that you saw the pictorial of. Then we're going to express out or push out all the components we don't want to have in there. And then we're going to wash those red blood cells with uh, saline. So it's basically a washing machine. It's the rinse cycle of a washing machine. And then what we're going to do is empty those healthy red blood cells into a, into a bag and then transfer that, transfuse that to the patient. Again, this is a picture of the device to my right, and this is a screen, just a, just a quick little pictorial of it just to share with you. It's exactly what, the way the, the screen should look right now. Um, and what it allows us to do is to modify, change things as we're going along so that you get a better product back. And what I'd like to do now is go into the live demonstration. So what we're gonna do is demonstrate to you exactly how the device works. It takes about 10 minutes, so as we're doing that, uh, if it's okay with you, I'd like to continue with the slides as well, because um, we're gonna be watching the blood move from one location to another. But I just wanna share with you exactly what's, what's going on at that time. So let me just move over here. So uh, I'm an anesthesiologist, but I'm gonna have to play a surgeon during this, this uh, demonstration. Because I'm sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is uh, we, first of all, I should say that, that accepting cell saver blood is a personal choice. Uh, there are some Joe's witnesses that choose not to accept cell saver blood. Uh, so we discuss the risk and the benefits, and then we, we explain how it works, and then it's a personal choice. So. Don't, don't mistake us. We're not telling you you have to accept it. It's a personal choice. But if, it, if we use it, uh, we can hook it up in a continuous circle. Uh, so it's always connected to the patient. Uh, for example, this would be connected to the surgical field to suction the blood that you're losing. Okay? And then after it's processed, the blood will end up coming through here. And this is connected to your IV, so it's a continuous circuit. And because this, this is a saline filled line that will be soon filled with cell saver blood. And, and that way, uh, there's no interruption. So should we start yes. processing? Absolutely. Or sucking? Start sucking. OK, so let's say that the patient's losing blood. And this is, by the way, that we bought this blood. It's, it's uh, from a bovine source, or a cow. So, and that's not me. I'm trying to lose weight. So this is how the suction works. So I, it goes into the reservoir there. It's working, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so right now, what we're doing now is we're you know, doing a representation of an actual surgical event. So the blood comes into the reservoir, and it's filtered by this dark filter right here. It's a um, gross particle filter, so we get large particles out. And now what the machine is doing is uh, it is now bringing blood down in, into the reservoir or into the bowl, as I shared with you earlier, that picture. Um, and those of you that are closer, and I'll keep quiet in a 
second so you can hear it. It actually sounds like a turn is spinning. That is the centrifuge in the center of the device, and when we're done, you can come up and look. But what's happening now is the bowl is spinning, and so as the blood is coming down in, it's going to separate out all the healthy red blood cells, and it's going to express out or push out all of the unwanted particles. I'll just put it to you that way. Um, and it'll go over here into this waste bag, so everything stays nice and closed. And even though we have the, the blanket over here to protect this nice carpeting, you know, feel very comfortable with the fact that we're not going to get blood on the carpet. So, and this takes a little bit of while for it to happen. Actually, uh, with human blood, uh, usually it's about seven minutes. So while this is processing and, and filling, let me come over back over to my slides and we'll, we'll discuss uh, a few more things. So as what Dr. Frank just shared with you is the collecting first. So we have an anticoagulant uh, that goes down to the very, this very tip of the tubing that uh, Dr. Frank had the Yankauer tip or the suction tip, and it mixes with the blood so that the anticoagulant keeps, it, again, the blood from clotting. It, it travels back up into this reservoir and then goes into the device uh, and the cell saver just as we were just demonstrating. So what it's going to do is it's going to separate out this anticoagulant and everything else that comes from the surgical field. So the blood, again, leaves that reservoir, comes down through that capillary tube that I shared with you earlier, and hits down on this plate right here, which is what made this even a more effective tool. Uh, Dr. Latham had the great idea of putting little turbine veins down here. So it actually separates it out. Again, acts like an agitator that we have in our washing machines. So the, right now the bowl is uh, spinning. The blood is filling up. It comes all the way up to the top. And once it does, it's pushing everything else out to this waste bag. See the word supernatant right here. That's what we refer to as the plasma, your white blood cells. The saline that we add, the anticoagulant, and then any saline that the table or the surgeon and the nurses may add to uh, to wash out the surgical field. So we're going to get everything out. And then what we do next, as you can see, the capillary tube now is blue. Um, and you can see a bunch of numbers over here that uh, are really more for a clinician to study and understand how much volume you're going to use for washing. But what we're doing now is we're bringing in saline. So we're now doing the rinse cycle, as I shared with you earlier, doing the rinse cycle uh, with those healthy red blood cells. So any red blood cells that uh, would have uh, hemolyzed through the, this process. They're going to be expressed out or pushed out. So what you're going to get back is your healthy red blood cells. And we, we use um, certain volumes to make sure, and these are the things that we presented to the FDA to make sure that you have the best product coming back to you so that uh, you're not having concerns about any contaminants coming back to you and you want to have your healthy red blood cells return to you. So that third phase that the machine will go into uh, once it's done washing will be uh, the empty phase. So we're going to take those healthy red blood cells and we're going to send those up to the reinfusion bag. And then from there, as Dr. Frank shared with you, we're gonna, it's all prime, so it's a continuous closed loop. And then from that reinfusion bag, the, the blood will automatically come right back to you. And what you'll have again is the final product, which is washed red blood cells. You're not getting the whole blood back. Um, and it'll be 95 to 99% uh, clean uh, of any of the contaminants in the hematic river. The amount of that volume, a known volume, is going to be 50 roughly 50%. It'll vary um, depending upon other things that are going on in the field and of the device as well. Um, and while the device is spinning, in fact, if you want to, why don't we do this? Uh, you can actually come up if you want to take a look and look down in and, and see how the device is working. Uh, and I can also answer any questions you may have with regards to um, cell saving. How much longer do you think it has to process to? At least another six minutes. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, we can entertain questions or come up and check it out. Tim can explain it. Yes, this is the bowl inside. Um, and you can see the, the infrared light. Uh, what we're doing is we're sending infrared light across 
the, the field, and whole red blood cells absorb that light at a different rate than, do, than does plasma free hemoglobin. Um, so once it hits a certain, once it hits that level, then we know to switch from the fill mode to the wash mode. And as you can see now, when the machine is telling us what it's doing, it should say empty right now. So we finished the wash. So now the red blood cells are going to go be sent up to the reinfusion bag. Okay. Yes, it was primed. Yeah, it was primed with saline. So this is the phase that I teasingly call when the, the laundry comes out of the washing machine and into the basket and your husband forgets where the clothesline is. Okay. So right now, and since we have a sufficient volume in here, it's actually going to be a continued process. Okay. So this continues going on as long as the device has volume in the reservoir um, and it returns it to, returns it to you, the patient. So there was a question about the word banked. Uh, so cell saver blood is never banked. So it, it's not put into the blood bank. It, it's, it stays in the operating room connected to the patient. So it's really part of your circulation because it's connected to your, your vascular system with the IVs. So uh, bank, banked is a term we use for the blood that comes from the blood bank. Which is, it's, we don't give that to Jehovah's Witness patients. So, at the beginning of the process, we cite this. Yes. 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 That's right. The first thing we do is, is suction. Well, we hand the suction to the surgeons, and they use that special suction uh, to recover the blood that, that you're losing. So, you know, when we don't use the cell saver, the, the suction blood get, gets wasted. Uh, it just ends up going in the trash, basically. And so, it doesn't make sense to, to put your fresh blood that you lose in the trash. We'd rather recover it and give it back to you. Can you talk more about the priming? The priming, sure. Sure. So, uh, one thing... So one thing we, we like to do is to prime the system with saline. Uh, those are the clear fluid bags that you see. And uh, that way uh, there's no air in the system. Uh, if you give air in someone's IV, it can be life-threatening. So we definitely want to prime the system with saline. And that way, uh, that also provides a continuous circulation with your body uh, because there's no air between you and the cell saver. It's a safety issue and a, and a continuity issue. Thank you. Tim, it worked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've never done this outside the operating room, so we were a little bit nervous. Uh, and the, the uh, reinfusion bag is filling, right? It's, yeah. it's filling. Yeah. So that would be the, the washed, processed blood that you see hanging from the pole. Right. And then we could run that straight into the patient's IV and uh, basically recover all the red cells that you lose. So this, this technique has saved two lives that I know of in the last three years at Johns Hopkins in Jehovah's Witness patients. So when, when we tell uh, patients the risk and the benefits, if it's, a, if it's a surgery with significant bleeding, then we recommend this, okay? Now, if you have, a let's say, a thyroid surgery where you're going to lose about a teaspoon of blood, okay, we're not going to recommend the cell sick, okay? So don't, don't take home the message that you always need this machine because I can, name, I can name 15 kinds of surgery right now where the blood loss is minimal, okay? And if you come in and ask for the cell saver, 
they, they're going to tell you that it's not necessary because we, we've ranked all the surgeries on a scale for the amount of blood loss that occurs. And so like the prostate surgeries we do nowadays with the robot, they lose maybe uh, 30 ounces of blood, okay? So it, it, the cell saver is not going to help. We may have it around as a backup, okay, just in case they get into bleeding. Sometimes we do that. We have the cell saver on standby as a backup maneuver, okay? For example, our next speaker, Stacy Scheib, is going to tell you about uh, gynecologic surgery. And uh, hi, Stacy. And sometimes with her cases, for example, we use the cell saver in a backup mode because she doesn't lose hardly any blood for some of the like uh, ovary or hysterectomy surgeries. So we'll have the cell saver around, like right in the room or outside the room, ready to use. So I'm going to introduce Stacy, uh, who's one of our favorite uh, GYN doctors, and we refer her a lot of patients, and we're privileged to have her uh, speak today. Welcome, Stacy. Uh -huh. Oh, one more question? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. You might have to speak up a little bit. Spinal surgery. Spinal surgery. Ah, yes. Uh, spine surgery comes in small, medium, and large. Uh, I learned that over the years. Uh, so if you're having a laminectomy, for example, you're going to lose maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, 50 cc's of blood. Okay, that's one percent of all the blood in your body. But if you have a five-level fusion, okay, that's a large spine surgery, and you could lose half of your blood volume, okay? So, so then we definitely want to use a cell saver. So a laminectomy, no, we probably won't use it. A five-level fusion, yes, we're going to use it. I'm so appreciative. Hi, I'm Stacy Scheib. Um, I'm so appreciative of being invited to speak. I think we've done a lot of good work over the past few years um, collaborating together to really push forward um, bloodless GYN surgery. Uh, there, there's a huge role for it here. Um, I've worked a lot with Jehovah's Witness during my time in Philadelphia. There's a huge Jehovah's Witness population up there. Um, and so I've really embraced it and I think especially with what I do, I'm a mentally invasive gynecologist, it's a great pairing together. Um, actually, that one of those two patients, the Dr. Andrews, was one, one of my patients. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was a very complex case, um, but that patient is doing great, went back home to Texas, and is doing remarkably well considering what happened. Um, so, we're going to talk about bloodless gynecologic surgery today. I have no disclosures, no conflicts of interest. So, the thing is, we want to know first, what are we treating? Um, in my world, these are um, this is not an exhaustive list. This is the most common things that women come to my office regarding. The top one being uterine fibroids. If we look at this room right now, if in terms of all women, this whole side has fibroids and that one, that side does not. That is, that is the difference. 70% um, of all, all women have fibroids and 80% of, of black females have fibroids at some point during their lifetime. So that is probably the biggest thing that I've seen. Um, this can present as heavy bleeding, but not all the time, um, which is why this is a particular um, complement to bloodless medicine. The other, the other symptoms you can have are bulk symptoms, uh, pressure on your bladder, pelvic pain, pain with sex, um, increase in abdominal girth, um, urinary frequency urgency, you may have symptoms of alternate of other diarrhea or constipation if the fibroids are particularly large. Adenomyosis is a condition of the uterus where the cells in the lining grow into the muscle layer and can present with very heavy bleeding or painful periods. Endometriosis is also very common. Um, most of the time it's asymptomatic, but it can present as infertility or as chronic pelvic pain. There are other, this is sort of a hodgepodge of, of topics, but um, pelvic pain in general we use minimally invasive surgery to evaluate for and to correct. Um, ovarian cysts for a number of different reasons why people get cysts 
focus on their ovaries, but um, that's a, another reason. Those menstrual uh, abnormalities that we don't put into the most common things like fibroids or adenomyosis. We use surgery commonly to evaluate for her infertility that we can't seem to find other reasons for. Um, and also for urine incontinence or pelvic floor uh, prolapse. These are probably the most common surgeries that I deal with in terms of those, those common um, problems. Hysterectomy being the most common, followed by myomectomy, a close second. Um, we also do surgeries on the ovary, both removal of the cyst or potential removal of the ovary, which is what hysterectomy is. Salpingostomy or salpingectomy is surgery regarding the fallopian tube. Scar tissue or lysis of adhesions, excision of endometriosis, and pelvic reconstruction. So the big question I always get asked is, why bother with a minimally invasive approach? Okay, why see a specialist that does minimally invasive surgery? Um, it's not uncommon for me to see a patient whose physician said, you're not a candidate. I'm like, oh, but you actually might be if you went to an expert. And there are, there are very big pros and cons. And in this particular patient population that we are trying to avoid blood, this is all the more important for us to, for you to see a specialist that does minimally invasive surgery because there are some huge benefits. The biggest one is activity. Of course, we get to go back to our normal activities pretty quickly. Most of my patients actually go home the same day from surgery, even from the hysterectomy, which is amazing, considering where, how, where things were when I trained. Um, and they can do stairs, they can walk, they can eat whatever they want that same day. That's pretty amazing. And because of that, we're actually decreasing the risk of postoperative complications, things like clot to your leg or a clot to your lungs, or a pneumonia or, or atelectasis, which are respiratory complications initially after surgery. Postoperative pain. Clearly, if we're going through small incisions, that's what minimally invasive, either going through the vagina or through small, tiny little incisions on your belly, compared to a big incision, of course, if you have a smaller incision, you're going to have less pain. The added benefit of that is, guess what? You don't need as much pain medication. And in this day of age, we're hearing all around the news about narcotic abuse and what do we deal with the drug issues. Like This is an added benefit of us being able to move forward, is that we're having to use a lot less pain medication. And this is the biggest one, um, is we clearly see when we work through small incisions, in tiny, and we have a camera that gets to amplify what we get to see, we tend to have much less blood loss. And also, clearly seen looking at your blood count, okay? We don't see the drops in it. And so, if we can do it minimally invasively, we want to do it. With specific procedures, specifically with myomectomy, we sometimes uh, also see less fibromal morbidities. That means you spike fevers for unknown reasons, which um, can affect more Blood, blood work and evaluation because we're trying to figure out the etiology of why you're having fevers. Um, this one is another big one, especially for the fibroid group, and the endometriosis group as well, is that we have less scar tissue when we can do things minimally invasively. Okay, scar tissue, what that means is scar tissue pulls things where they're not supposed to be. And that can be a bad thing. So if it's affecting your fallopian tubes, I can cause infertility if you get scar tissue after a surgery. And so we know from a lot of studies, so they did this great study in, in Italy where they looked, they went back and looked after after people had open surgery and people who had laparoscopic surgery in the past. And they clearly saw if you had laparoscopic surgery, you had a much lower chance of getting scar tissue. And that's important too. Also, because of the downstream effects. If you have scar tissue in your pelvis too, because it pulls things where it's not supposed to be, if you have any subsequent surgery, it can increase the risk of having other injuries or having a greater blood loss. And so it has a downstream effect. So it's prevention as well. And, and a, a topic that's very near and dear is related to fertility and because I deal with a lot of fibroids and a lot of women who are trying to get pregnant, if 
because of fibroids or because of endometriosis. Um, after laparoscopic surgery, we clearly get a better outcome in terms of getting pregnant sooner, okay, and improving, improving that outcome. So how do we, how, do, how does my team work with the bloodless medicine group? Our goal is for you guys. We want to have patient-tailored care. We want to honor your wishes in the best way that we can, okay? We want, we want to increase the chances of minimally invasive surgery for you for all the reason I just talked about. And the last one is we want to make it work in a way that we keep you safe at all times and minimize risk to you as much as we can. And that really comes from a team approach uh, that we are talking together, that we work together, and when you have a team that consistently works over and over together, things work better, okay? We get better outcomes. We know that through all different fields. If we look at all fields, airline industry, look at surgery outcomes, you know, when we have set teams that are dedicated and work together, things work better. This is what I tell my residents all the time and my fellows, an ounce of prevention <laughs> goes a long way. Um, and that's where the team approach really works, is that we know what's potentially coming. I'm going to put all those things in place to try to prevent bad things from happening. So the most common reason that I may need to involve lotus medicine, most commonly, is because I have a patient who is anemic and is also a Jehovah's Witness or, or doesn't accept blood products for other reasons. And now they're bleeding from their vagina because of their fibroids or because they're adenomyosis or a polyp or whatnot. And so what we need to do is get them to a better place. It's always better to, to, to do some preventative measures before we ever even get to the operating room. So maybe I won't even need to even consider this machine at all, okay? So the analogy I always use with my residents is, it's like a leaky bucket. I need a plug hole, okay? Otherwise, I'm never gonna fill that bucket back up. I can give you all the erythropoietin, all the iron, all the folate. It doesn't matter if I don't stop your bleeding, okay? And so, because ideally, in preparation for surgery, I want us to get to a point where your blood count is in a much better place, and ideally in the normal range, okay? And so, this is what we're gonna do. So I may try to stop your period for a little while so that I can plug that bucket, okay? And allow things to come back up. Or I might need to do a uterine artery embolization to try to secure that blood supply a little bit more to optimize our chances of, of, of not needing a blood transfusion or eating or any other interventions. Okay. So these are things that we do. Also, one thing I did put on there, I realized in hearing your talk, is that sometimes I, if they want to auto donate, I say, okay, let's auto donate. But then I may delay your surgery for a little bit longer so that I can get your blood count to a better spot so that we are as tip-top position as possible. I like my little ducks in a row, I don't like surprises, and I don't want a surprise for my patients either. Okay? And so this is, this is, you know, and I'm very animate with my patients and I'm very forthright because the bottom line is I want to keep you safe. Okay. I'm going to give you some examples of some of the cases that we've done over the years. Um, this is case one. She was a 54-year-old who had, had one child in the past, long-standing history of fibroids. She had heavy bleeding, pelvic pressure, fullness, low back pain, and leg pain. She was done with having kids, so she was ready for definitive treatment with a hysterectomy. She had already, she was already has a history of anemia, that's, which is clear because her blood count is, is, is low. Um, she had attempted to do more conservative management in the past with a uterine artery embolization to treat her fibroids, but it had failed, which is not uncommon. Um, about 30% of women who have had an embolization need some other intervention within five years. Um, and we knew she had a big uterus walking into this. So what this means, she has a 20-week CSI fibroid uterus, is that uterus is somewhere between her belly button and her, the bottom of her root. So it is going up into her upper abdomen, and she is the equivalent of someone who's probably six or seven months pregnant. That's a big uterus. Not very comfortable. So we had discussed it in our fibroid conference, and we, 
review all of our images with the interventional radiologist to see what options are on the table. We ultimately came to, we thought the best option for her would be to do a laparoscopic hysterectomy, okay? But to do a, a uterine artery embolization prior to the hysterectomy to try to get that blood supply under control a little bit better prior to us going to the operating room. I also pro, pro postponed her surgery for three months um, in order to get her blood count back up to normal range because I gave her a medication called Agestin, which is a progesterone hormone to try to suppress her period temporarily and stop her period. And I also gave her iron to bring it back up. Okay, so by the time we got to surgery, her blood count was normal. She had minimal bleeding, and we actually had a very successful um, hysterectomy. To give you a sense of how big it was, a normal uterus is about 70 grams, seven zero. Hers was 2006, and she went home the next day and was back to the most of her normal activities in a few weeks. Another case is that we did, um, this is a 42-year-old with an acute episode of vaginal bleeding. She really didn't want a hysterectomy, though. She was not ready, even though she had um, completed having all of her children. And when I examined her, she her cervix was dilated, and we had a big fibroid sort of popping out through the cervix. By the way, that's not normal. Not normal at all. Okay? And when we looked at the MRI, she had a cervix, a cervical fibroid, which is actually a more difficult fibroid to tackle because they usually have a big blood supply from the main blood vessel or the uterine artery to the uterus. Um, and so they tend to have a much higher blood, blood, um, blood loss rate because we can't give other medications that we normally do during a myomectomy to try to get that uterus to contract down or get it to slow down on the bleeding because it doesn't really work. Those medicines don't work with the cervix. And so we also did a combined UAE, but I did a myomectomy through the vagina this time. Um, and she went home the same day. We lost maybe a few tablespoons of blood at that. <laughs> Here's another patient. So this one um, is a 30-year-old. She had never had a, she had never had children, and she really, really wanted to have children. But she had a really, really large thyroid uterus, and she really wanted someone to try to keep that uterus for her because before she came to see me, she had seen two other providers who would only offer her a hysterectomy because she was a Jehovah's Witness. And, but she was passing clots through her with her period, constipation, bloating, pain with sex, and it was to the point that she couldn't have sex with her husband. Okay. So unfortunately, for someone who wants to keep their fertility, we only have two options on the table. One, go get pregnant, which clearly she can't do. She's not having sex, because it hurts. Or two, we need to proceed with a myomectomy. So her uterus went all the way up to her ribcage, all the way up to her liver, so all the way up here, like she was pregnant. So we did something unusual. So we did a UAE as well, but we used something that um, dissolves quickly, so something called gel foam, so that I wouldn't compromise her fertility long term. And we did a, I did do an open myomectomy, which I don't usually do, but because of this, I really wanted to lay hands on it so I could keep her uterus, as, like I promised her. And I put a tourniquet around it, um, sort of like when you give blood, where we put a, they put a little rubber band around your arm, so we did a similar thing on, on the blood vessels to her uterus. And we got out 3,200 grams of fibroid. And she still has a normal uterus now and is getting ready to get pregnant. So the last case which I should have included was the one patient that I we did almost that really did need this machine right here. Is was a patient I did do an open myomectomy on and she came all the way from Texas to see me. She had had two prior myomectomies already, so two other surgeries to remove her fibroids. That makes the surgery very difficult, like I said. If you've had a myomectomy, that is a surgery notorious for causing scar tissue, and scar tissue is bad. It causes things to go where they're not supposed to be. So her bowels were attached to her uterus, and her uterus was attached to the main vessels to her leg. 
So when we tried to dissect it out, and I ended up having another surgeon who come and assist me because of the complexity of the case, we ended up getting into the vein of her right leg and had to call vascular surgery to come and assist. So we used the cell saver while doing the case while we could repair her vein and get her uterus out. And she felt great the next day. She went home two days after surgery and is doing great in Texas and is looking forward to one day having children. So our goals here at Hopkins are to really tailor our care to what your goals are. I don't want to dictate to you what you should have. I'll give my recommendations, but it's totally up to you what you want. And if, if it's in our power, we will try to accommodate. And we have a couple of locations. Yeah, any questions? Great job, Stacy. Yes, Joan might have the first question. <laughs> insurance you have factor into being able to come to the blood that you I have not had a problem with insurance issues with sending patients to the blood test. At least uh, up until now. I can try to answer that. Yeah. Fabulous yeah. talk, Stacy. Thank you. It's really nice. Um, I've learned a lot. 
so the only time we have problems with insurance is with someone who has Medicaid and they're from out of state. Okay, those are the challenging patients. Okay, everything else that we do seems to work out just fine. So that that's the short answer. And uh, Andy may know more about insurance than I do, but that's even in those cases we found a way around it because we we have some special strings we can pull to get it done. I have a question for Stacy. So uh, historically. Uh, Doctors compare tumors to fruit in the grocery store. So is a 3,200 gram tumor, is that like a cantaloupe or a watermelon? That is a watermelon. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm, it's we, a watermelon. You know, when someone has an apricot-sized tumor, that's how we describe it. So. We like fruit medicine. Yeah. <laughs> Medicare, but no gap insurance. I think on a case-by-case -case basis, um, we have people in our department that work with patients to figure that stuff out. And it's usually not the doctors. Uh, so I wish I could give you a better answer, but we, we have ways to work it out. Now, I think we're going to take one more question because we promised Tim a break, okay? so we can uh, take down the cell saver. And so one more question, then we'll take a break, and then Linda Reesar, who's our hematology specialist, she's going to give the last talk. And can we do one more question? Yes, Dion. Oh, that's right. You just uh, joined the radiology department <laughs> as an insurance expert, right? Okay, how about we can have you answer after so, the break? Yeah. After the break. Because I promised Tim we'd take down the cell saver. Yeah, I can answer a question during the break. Oh, during the break. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. No Linda, uh, welcome. And uh, we'll get finished on time, I'm sure. Thank you, everybody. Uh, 
Well, first I want to thank um, Steve and our um, Bloodless group and all of you for coming today. It's really a pleasure um, to be here and to speak at this meeting every year. And it's especially fun because we get to see our patients when they're in the hospital, when they're sick, when they're coming to our clinic because they have a medical problem. So it's really fun to just see everyone when they're well and we're having fun and talking about what we do. Um, and so as, um, as Steve mentioned, our real goal is to make sure that your blood is at a safe level and make sure that you're healthy. And so in doing that, we've come up with a number of protocols and we have um, some exciting plans for the future to make things even better. And another thing that I'm gonna share with you in my talk today is how we teach other doctors how to take care of you. Um, while we would love to take care of every bloodless patient there is, that's not always possible. So another very important goal of our program is to educate other doctors and nurses about how to take care of our bloodless patients. So as you heard earlier, um, the general principles of our care are first to diagnose and treat anemia. And um, in doing so, we can get you safely through surgery or through your medical illness um, and keep your blood at a safe level. And also, as you heard about, another major goal of our program is to minimize blood loss. So I think Dr. Frank mentioned this, but your average patient who's in an intensive care unit, just from getting blood tests alone, um, a patient loses 1% of their blood volume. So you can imagine 10 days in a hospital, you could lose 10% of your blood volume. So we're really careful. We make sure that all of our patients are getting their blood drawn with pediatric tubes, teeny tiny tubes, so that you don't have to lose it just for a blood test. And the other thing we do is we make sure that every blood test that gets ordered is absolutely needed. You know, a lot of times things are just done by routine, but really aren't helpful to the care of our patients. So we take um, extra care and caution to make sure that when we need to draw blood, we're taking the least amount that's necessary and that every test is necessary that we're drawing from your body. Um, another thing that we do is diagnose and treat um, bleeding disorders. Um, many of us take aspirin. So if you took an aspirin a week ago, you know, your platelets are still affected by that aspirin. Platelets take about 10 days um, to circulate within our body. So even having taken an aspirin a week ago affects your bleeding risk. So we try to find out what our patients are taking if they're going to <coughs> surgery. We um, counsel them to stop those kinds of agents. And if they go through an emergency surgery, it's good to know what's in their system because what could cause excess bleeding. And something I don't have time to talk about is we also think about other parts of your blood. I mean, we talk mostly about blood strength and anemia today, um, but we also look at platelets, which are the part of our blood that helps our bodies clot. And we've had a number of um, bloodless GW patients with low platelets, and we find a way to treat that without giving you transfusions. So what is anemia? Just so we're all on the same page, and I apologize um, to those of you who um, can pronounce Greek words better than me, but anemia actually comes from the Greek word enhain, which means without blood. So when somebody has anemia, they have generally a decreased number of red cells and a decreased amount of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the protein in our blood that makes our blood red. And its primary job is to carry oxygen to our tissues. So a very important job. And this is what it looks like. When I look at your blood under the microscope, so if you're a patient with fibroids and you're going to see Dr. Shai, she may say, check out this blood, it's low, how can we best treat it? So we'll look at it under the microscope. And you can see on the left, you see lots of these little donut-shaped red cells. That's what it should look like. If you're anemic, you have fewer red cells and a less amount of hemoglobin. And this is actually the real deal. So you see on the left, this is a, a patient's blood smear. You can see there are lots of little red um, cells. They look like donuts. And like a good donut, you don't want it to have a big center. Only about a center third of the whole diameter of the red cell should be pale. And then on the right, you can barely see those red cells. In fact, we call those ghost cells. And for patients who have severe iron deficiency anemia, their red cells are small, they have fewer red cells, and they have less hemoglobin, so they look like a ghost. And you can also see some of them are misshapen. They're shaped like hot dogs or teardrops, and that's characteristic of iron deficiency. So we look at your blood under the microscope. It helps us tell why you have the low blood. And then how does one determine whether you really have anemia? Um, so we use two measures generally. They're usually um, obtained by a simple blood count, which I'm sure everybody in the room has had at some point. It's called a complete blood count, a CDC. And in doing that, we calculate the hematocrit. 
And that's actually, um, as you heard in the really interesting talk about the cell saver, your red cells are fairly heavy. So if you put them in a tube, like a straw, and you spin them, the heavy cells go to the bottom, and the percentage that are red blood cells is your hematocrit. And I'll show you a little diagram of that um, to help you conceptualize that. We can also use a Coulter counter machine to measure how much hemoglobin is there. And so those are the two numbers we look at to determine whether you have anemia. Okay, and so here you can see is a picture of somebody's hands with anemia. They're pale, and sometimes when one has iron deficiency, you can actually get flattening of the nail beds, like we call it spooning. And if you see on the left that tube, that's a one way to measure the hematocrit. You take the blood, you put it into a tiny tube, you clog up the end, and you spin it in a centrifuge. And then the amount that's red cells, that's shown with dark um, marks in this tube, that's the measure of the hematocrit. Okay, and for a normal adult male, it's somewhere between 42 and 45. For a normal adult female, um, it's somewhere between uh, 37 and 42. And anemia has been around since the beginning of time. Here's um, a beautiful painting of somebody who I think looks a little pale and maybe a bit tired. Symptoms of anemia. And anemia, however, can be challenging to diagnose. Um, one of these patients is our, one of our bloodless patients, and in fact, last year during this presentation, he was in the hospital, um, and today is doing well. Um, another, the other um, picture is a sibling, and so just looking at those two pictures, I think most of us wouldn't be able to pick out which, which of these adorable little children has anemia. It turns out it's the little boy, and if you look closely at his gums and his lips, they're pale compared to his sister. Although she has a lighter complexion, her um, little tongue and lips are really rosy. So she's the patient or the child who does not have anemia, and it's her brother who has anemia. And he's one of our bloodless patients because he's very severely alloimmunized. He has sickle cell, and he cannot accept transfused blood. So when he comes in, we have to treat him very carefully. Um, we use pediatric tubes, and we um, try to do everything we can for his body to maintain his level of hemoglobin. Okay. And why is it important? Why do we care about anemia? Why do we need our red cells? Well, in this picture, I'm showing um, the picture of the donut-shaped cells, the little sacs of hemoglobin, and they actually go to our lungs where they pick up oxygen. And then the basic job of these little sacs of hemoglobin is to deliver the oxygen to our vital organs, like our brain, our heart, our muscles. Um, so it's really a, an essential life function. Um, we need our red cells to deliver oxygen to our tissues and organs, and our organs and tissues need that to function. Um, so when we are evaluating a patient um, with anemia, what kinds of things do we look at? Um, I showed you we will look at the blood smear, we'll measure the hematocrit. Um, one of the most common causes for anemia around the world, in fact, is iron deficiency. So that's usually one of the tests we check on our patients. Um, in older folks who are of um, Eastern European ethnicity, B12 deficiency is pretty common. Um, folate deficiency is common in parts of the world um, like Africa or in women who have um, a hemolytic anemia, like the little boy I showed you, he has sickle cell. Patients who have red cells that are turning over faster are at risk for folate. So we will check for those um, nutritional deficiencies. Um, many of our patients, especially elderly patients, can have renal dysfunction or renal insufficiency. And as I'll share with you later, the kidney is a really important organ. It makes a hormone called erythropoietin, and that hormone tells your body to make blood. So if somebody's kidney is not working normally, they often will have low levels of this hormone, and so they need more. Um, and so we determine whether they have renal insufficiency. Another common cause for anemia in our patients is anemia of chronic disease. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, obesity, lung disease, these all can actually cause anemia. They cause underlying inflammation, with, which interferes with your body's ability to use iron and make new red blood cells. So it's important for us to figure out why you have anemia so we know how to manage it. Um, for some patients, we look for hemoglobinopathies, like sickle cell and the little boy I showed you. Um, and also, we're very careful to ask our patients about bleeding diathesis. Do you have bad nosebleeds? For women, do you have fibroids? Do you have heavy menstrual bleeding? Um, we want to know if this occurs and why it occurs, so that if you're going through surgery or if you're just managing a medical illness, we can better help you build up your blood if we know why, it's, why the low blood has occurred, why the anemia has occurred. 
Um, so how do we treat it once we diagnose it? Um, as I mentioned, iron globally, worldwide, is the most common cause of anemia. And in order for your bodies to make hemoglobin and red cells, you need iron. So we will often supplement. And for those of you old enough to remember Popeye, I think we all learned that spinach is a good, good source of iron. And that's actually not true. For a vegetable, it's not bad. But if you really need iron, you're really not going to get it the way Popeye did. Um, what you really need are meats, um, and in particular red meats, and some chicken and fish. And you know, many of us are very health conscious. A lot of people are cutting back on red meat. So sometimes you just can't get enough from diet. And in that case, we will often go to supplementing. And the easiest way to supplement for somebody who's at home and just has a low level of anemia is with iron pills. Um, and I'm showing you a picture there. Um, sometimes um, iron is not easy to tolerate. For some of us, it can cause a little bit of constipation or indigestion. Or sometimes you just have a really significant um, deficiency and we need to fix it fast. You need to have your surgery soon or you just really can't tolerate the iron. So in that case, we do IV iron. And um, we've been um, changing and improving our protocols over the years. Um, there are newer iron um, dextran um, preparations, which are very good sources of iron for our patients who are outpatients. We can give them up to 1,000 milligrams in a single visit. So that's wonderful for, for patients who are traveling far to our center. You can come in for a single dose and just restore your iron stores. For inpatients, we use something called iron sucrose. It's a slightly lower dose but it's available through our um, hospital pharmacy, and that enables us to give you little doses every day you're in the hospital. Um, so um, we're constantly looking for the best and the safest iron preparations, and our practice has changed over the year. A few of, the, a few of those iron preparations on the list we used before, um, and more recently, I, we're using the ones that I circled there for you. And then what else can we do to treat anemia? I think some of you are probably familiar with Lance Armstrong, and some of you have been reading about um, the various blood doping practices of um, some of the um, athletes who've been banned from the Olympics. So EPO is a drug that, that has been used by athletes, in particular cyclists, um, because it's the hormone that our bodies normally make. Our kidneys, in fact, is what makes EPO. And they sense low oxygen. So when you have low blood, you have low oxygen. The kidney says, uh-oh, we need to make more blood. So the kidney makes erythropoietin, and that goes to our bone marrow and tells us to make more blood. Athletes who used it would give themselves extra EPO. And people who have renal disease, we will supplement with EPO. Um, and what EPO does is, it, as I mentioned, it's made in the kidneys, it goes to the bone marrow, and it tells your bone marrow to make more blood cells. And let's just take a look at what that looks like. So this is actually a picture of a bone marrow from a patient, and those um, big blue cells with the big purple centers, those are young blood cells, and those are the cells on which EPO is acting. EPO is coming up to those cells and saying, make more blood cells, and then eventually you get the donut-shaped red cells that are carrying hemoglobin and oxygen throughout our body. So how do we do that for our patients? There are a number of preparations that we use. Um, we give typically to our outpatients about 20 or 30,000 international <coughs> units. Um, and we like to work with you. We want to personalize your care so that you're getting the best care and it's the most convenient for your life. Um, you've heard we treat patients from all over the country, even all over the world. So if you're living you know, in Virginia and you need to build up your blood, we can contact your primary care provider and say, well, let's have you come in once a week, twice a week, get EPO, which can usually be given in a primary care office subcutaneously. And then we'll also supplement you with iron and make sure your blood's at a safe level so that when you come in for your surgery, you're at um, a very safe and normal level. For our patients who are on dialysis, we like to give IV EPO. You're already getting IV access for dialysis, so IV is great. Um, you can get the medicine right into your vein. It's the fastest acting, and um, it's a very safe approach. There are other um, EPO preps that are sort of slow release preps, and in some cases we use that too. And one of those preparations is called Darby Poitin. So when we started, we actually relied very heavily on a study that was published out of um, Philadelphia on how to manage bloodless patients. But since then, we really advanced that practice. And I just drew a circle around a number of the papers that have come out of our program. And I think some of you were asking, how can we access those papers and give them to our doctors? So we can, if you send an email or contact Andy, we can make sure you get those papers. And the abstracts are actually on our website. 
But the strategies that we use are first a team evaluation. Many of you have met Andy, our coordinator. We have a couple of wonderful nurses. You've heard from Steve, our anesthesiologist, and, and I'm the hematologist. Um, we manage anemia with iron, as I mentioned, sometimes EPO. And we also come up with a target hemoglobin with our surgeons, like Stacy. Um, what is the best number that you feel comfortable that we can get this patient through the surgery safely? Um, it used to be patients, surgeons were afraid, you know, oh, if a patient doesn't accept blood, I just can't do it. And now that we've built a team and we have lots of approaches to help our patients, many of our surgeons are very comfortable with it. And they're getting more comfortable with lower levels, which is good for all of us. Um, because having too much hemoglobin has risks, as does having too little. Um, and here, as I mentioned, we treat um, bleeding diathesis or a predisposition to bleeding. And these are all of our papers where we built on these, this initial experience and I think have improved it considerably. So how are we doing? Um, for those of you who were here last year, I showed this slide. You can see that um, from between 2013 and 2015, we prepared a number of outpatients um, for surgery and they were coming in with low hemoglobins and our treatments were very effective. How are we doing this year? Um, even better, we have this really low p-value, which basically tells us the difference between the starting hemoglobin and the subsequent hemoglobin. And we are, this is actually um, not the full number of patients, but we've had many, many patients who are getting to surgeries. And you can see the hemoglobins are um, in the normal range when our patients are going to surgery. And the other thing that's kind of interesting, the actual hemoglobin level is slightly lower when we include all the recent patients. And I think that reflects the idea that because we have this very supportive, helpful team, our surgeons are feeling much more comfortable with our patients. And so um, it used to be cardiac surgery patients, the surgeon would like hemoglobins that were super normal. Now that we've had many patients safely get through procedures and they know there's a team to support them for anemia, they're feeling more comfortable with more normal values. So the actual number, um, interestingly, is slightly lower. Um, but um, the patients are doing beautifully, as you heard about. And this is just another example of one of our patients. She actually has uterine fibroids, and I think she'll be seeing you soon. Um, she had anemia, and um, like many of us, she was a very conscientious employee. She wanted to you know, take care of her anemia, but she didn't want to miss work. So we actually treated her between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning. She came in and got iron infusions. Started out quite anemic, um, 5.9, and, and I believe I told you earlier the normal value for women is about 11 or 12, so really low. Came in early in the morning, got iron infusions, and before not too long, she was completely normal. So we really try to work with you in terms of treatment. Is it better for you to get the iron and EPO with your local doctor? Should you come here? What time of the day can we treat you? We really want to make this an optimal experience. We want to help you get better and we want it to fit in with your life. Um, in response to actually this request from patients in meetings um, in the past, um, people ask, well, what happens if iron and EPO aren't an option? What if I'm in an accident? What if there's a trauma and I need blood fast? Well, there are actually hemoglobin substitutes and we've been able to um, to work with the companies and get protocols through our institution. So we now actually have two of these products available for our patients at all times. Um, one of them is called Sanguinate, and it's a cow, a bovine hemoglobin, and it's um, specially processed. It's called pegylated, which means it's coated in sugar so that it can last um, for a longer period of time in your body. If we were just to give you the naked um, cow hemoglobin, it would actually be destroyed by enzymes that are normally circulating in your body. So by coating it with sugar, it lasts longer. And we have this now available all the time for our patients. We try not to use it because it's not as effective as your own hemoglobin, but, but we're very pleased that it's available. Um, we also have another substance called Hemapure, and that's shown here. It's also a bovine hemoglobin um, um, agent. It's processed in a different way. It's chemically cross-linked, shown here, to enhance its stability. Um, and if you look at it in the bloodstream, it's much smaller than a red cell. A red cell has a large number of hemoglobin molecules. These are just tiny, isolated molecules, but they function in carrying oxygen to your vital organs. So over the next couple of years, what we're hoping to do is to determine which of these is most effective and safest and to um, come up with protocols so that we can safely give this to you should you need it. 
Um, another area where our program has really grown and where we have um, some, some really nice outcomes is in cancer therapy. Um, probably everybody knows somebody who's had cancer chemotherapy. Oftentimes you lose your hair. Um, and the reason for that is most of the drugs that we have available to us, they target cells that are rapidly growing and dividing. Cancer cells tend to rapidly grow and divide. That's why patients lose their hair. We need haircuts, I guess, about once or twice um, every few months. And so those are cells that are rapidly growing and dividing. A problem for our bloodless patients then is that your blood cells are rapidly growing and dividing. So if you've got a drug that affects that type of cycling cell, you can have toxicity and get anemic. And so we're working to personalize your therapy so that you can hopefully get treatment for the cancer without causing toxicity to your bone marrow. And one example of that has been in um, a number of lung cancer patients. Normally we would use um, a chemotherapeutic agent called cisplatinum that not only kills rapidly growing cancer cells, but also turns off your blood production in your marrow. We've switched over to a gentler agent, an agent that can kill the cancer cells but won't affect your marrow as much, and that's called carboplatinum. And we've had a number of patients get through their therapy without any need for um, even EPO. And in some of our cases, we've used EPO to help the patients get through their therapy. Um, blood cancers, lymphoma and leukemia is another area where um, it can be challenging if transfusions are not an option. We've had um, a patient um, get through successful lymphoma therapy with some EPO and iron. Um, we also have other patients who are getting um, currently treated at our institution and are doing very well. And in recent years, we've had, or actually in recent months, we've had a couple patients with bladder cancer. And um, bladder cancer can be associated with bleeding, and so our patients can get anemic and iron deficient. And we've been helping these patients get through therapy with um, iron and, in some cases, EPO, and working with their um, oncologists to come up with therapies that are the least toxic to the marrow but the most beneficial in treating the cancer. And why are we doing this? What's, what's the reason we're all here? Um, it's really safe and successful therapy, surgery, and outcomes for our patients. And this is just one of my um, uh, wonderful families that I've had the privilege to care for. Um, Joan Sholden in the middle is currently getting therapy for anemia and cancer. And I had the privilege of caring for their little girl, um, Sholden in the pink dress on the left, um, who had low platelets. And we were able to keep her platelets in a safe range. Um, and another patient, um, one of my very favorites who's here today, um, is Miss Hazel Skinner. And she is just, um, as you can see, not only is she beautiful, but she has one of the most sunniest personalities you will ever meet. Um, and she has been really courageously um, managing a long time um, history of anemia and doing it beautifully. Um, and I'm particularly proud that Hazel comes to see us and see me because she actually lives in Philadelphia and she used to go to the, um, the local bloodless program, which actually was a long, around longer than our program. Um, but once she came here, she now um, prefers to come here for therapy. And I think one of the things we do really well is to work as a team with our patients. Nobody knows their body better than the patient themselves. And Hazel, um, when she knows when something's not right, she will either call or text me or Liz or Andy and say, you know, um, I can tell my blood's going down, you know, I'm getting anemic, and so what we'll do, we'll call her doctors, we'll find out what the latest level is, we'll find out what her EPO dose is, what her iron is, and we'll make sure we treat it before it becomes a problem. So we really try to establish um, excellent teamwork and have very open communication. And I feel very privileged to work with my team where there are so many wonderful people who can reach out to our patients, help them, and, and keep them healthy and keep their blood levels safe before they become a problem. So I wanted to show off that beautiful picture. And many of her beautiful family members are here. I've gotten to meet lots of sisters and nieces, and it's always a real pleasure. When I see Hazel on my clinic list, I get excited to go to clinic because <laughs> I know it's going to be a wonderful day. Um, and then here's another patient that I wanted to share her beautiful picture with you. She has a lymphoma, had blood clots, and anemia. And as you can see, she's doing beautifully. I mean, she also came from a number of other hospitals in Virginia and the Washington, D.C. area and now comes to see us. Um, and 
Another really important goal of our program is, you know, like I said, we would love to take care of all the bloodless patients in the world, but that's really not feasible. So we're very dedicated to um, teaching bloodless therapy, not only for doctors here, but for doctors in other parts of the world. And I was recently in China where um, due to limited resources in some parts of the country and very um, dense patient populations, um, medicine there is effectively bloodless because there aren't resources to provide blood for the patients. And I had the opportunity to consult on a little baby with a very um, serious blood disorder. And um, I'm showing you a picture of, um, you can't, the baby's so tiny, just a couple months old, you really can't see the baby, but here are the team of doctors that I worked with. Um, and I just got an email yesterday, actually, that this little baby's doing really well. Um, and here's just to show you the outside of the hospital. It was in the Hainan province of China in Haiko, um, which is in the south area. And it's a really big hospital with lots of patients. So um, as I mentioned, one of our really um, important goals of our program is to teach other doctors how to care for patients um, with bloodless medicine. And so what do we look for um, in the future? What do we want to do better? We want to continue to improve our therapies to build up your blood so you can go and see Dr. Shai and come out with a wonderful surgical outcome. Um, we'd like to advance um, the hemoglobin substitute field because sometimes there are going to be instances where people lose a lot of blood fast and we want to make sure that um, we can treat you effectively. Certainly cell saver is, is a, a real advance in our field and um, we want to be um, constantly evaluating the hemoglobin substitutes to see what will be best for you. Um, we also want to look for approaches to build white blood cells and platelets um, when those um, parts of your blood are low. And actually in my own lab, we're looking at blood stem cells and trying to find ways to coax blood stem cells to make blood better, to make platelets better, to make white cells better, and to make hemoglobin um, carrying blood cells better. And then the other thing um, that's a big area, because it's increasing as our population ages, um, is cancer therapy. And um, we are looking for new agents and new approaches to kill cancer cells without affecting your blood cells. And I was actually just in Germany um, earlier this summer working with a company that's trying to develop drugs that will kill the cancer cells without killing your blood cells or without um, suppressing the growth of your blood cells. And they also have this agent that um, blocks um, a pathway, it's called hepcidin, which for patients who have inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes and their bodies aren't making blood very well because they're inflamed, they actually have an agent that can block that hepcidin pathway so that their bodies can start making blood better. So we're constantly looking for better ways to care for you, better ways to improve your blood strength, and new ways to treat um, cancer and, and other problems that could affect your level of hemoglobin in your anemia. So um, again, the real reason we're here is because of you. And I always um, love to share the pictures of our beautiful patients. Um, and it also equally important, because not everybody can come here, is to teach other physicians and uh, nurses and care providers throughout the world how to care for our bloodless patients. Um, and I showed you an example of China. Last year, we had a student from Saudi Arabia who was able to come to this conference. He's actually flying in today to, to learn more bloodless medicine. Um, and, and in closing, I just want to um, extend a very special thank you to all of you here, because you're the reason we're here, and you're why we do what we do. In this picture, I like to think she's clapping for our program. <laughs> so I wanted to end on that and, and take time for some questions. And a special thank goes out to Hazel and her wonderful family for coming all the way from Philadelphia. Sickle cell. Um, so we have a number of bloodless sickle cell patients in our program, and um, you know those patients normally have anemia. So we want to prevent um, any worsening in anemia. And there are some um, drugs um, 
um, out there that can be beneficial. You may have heard of hydroxyurea, for instance, which is a drug that actually helps to turn on the kind of hemoglobin we all had when we were um, fetuses. It's called fetal hemoglobin. And what happens is this, this drug increases the production of fetal hemoglobin, which normally we make when we're fetuses, and during the first year of life, it gets turned off. So we turn it back on, and it turns out that this dilutes the sickle hemoglobin, and it can also build up the strength of the blood. So I think that's one of the more promising therapies that's that is available to our sickle cell patients. There are newer drugs on the horizon that are being tested that could do the same thing, and that could potentially be safer. But I think for our sickle cell patients, that's the most promising area. Other questions? Thank you again for coming to our program. It's wonderful to see everybody. So one more thing. There's a, a questionnaire in the packet. It has 10 questions. We would be so grateful if you could turn in the questionnaire. And Andy has pens if you need a pen by the door. And it's just so we can know better how to serve the community. And, and what you guys want to hear, for example, in our next seminar. So thank you so much for being here.